this was a pretty interesting discussion. They're talking about the Bernie movement. Where is the left supposed to go from here? Uh, kind of taking a look back at the past and what could possibly change in the future. And maybe looking at some of the things, some of the mistakes that we may have made, like during the Bernie movement and where we can you know, possibly do something differently going forward. Uh, there's a couple, hold on. Yeah, there's a couple of things that he says here that I think are very important. And I, I do want to talk about them because he really got me thinking. And then there's a clip on Twitter that I want to show you as well um, from this interview. But let's go ahead and get started with this. If you haven't seen this interview, I highly recommend that you check it out because I think it can be a learning lesson, you know, for those of us on the left, especially those of us that came from that Bernie's movement. I think we can learn a little bit of something from Norm. So let's dive in. The problem with what's going on with forced to vote and everything is you never try to reach out to your potential constituency. That was the whole promise of the Bernie Sanders campaign. It was mass mobilization. It was organizing your constituency. It was getting them involved in the political process. Because the point of a left politics is the emancipation of the working class has to be accomplished by the working class itself, not by the fashionistas or the squad inside Congress. And that was never done. That was the big disappointment of Bernie Sanders because. So this piece right here, let me just go back just a little bit. This was kind of a wake up call to me. Them go ahead. Involved go in the political process because the point of a left politics is the emancipation of the working class has to be accomplished by the working class itself, not by the fashionistas or the squad inside Congress. And that was never done. So let's talk about this part here for a second. Uh, and I think this is the piece that maybe we did miss, right? Like, it's almost like we were expecting Bernie Sanders and the squad to, I guess, accomplish the movement, continue leading the movement, right? But what Norm is saying here is that technically, it was actually on the working class to do it ourselves. But this is where I would say this is this was one of the problems with Justice Democrats, because the strategy of Justice Democrats, one of the things that they're the main thing that they were supposed to do is there were a list of policies that they were supposed to follow. Or if you want to call them principles, per se, there were a list of principles that they were supposed to follow and they were supposed to go into Congress and fight against the corporate Democrats, the establishment Democrats, and push forth, you know, push forth these issues that we're fighting for. That was a part of the Justice Democrats strategy. Like that, if you look it up, look up Justice Democrats. It spells it out for you. It spells it out exactly what was supposed to happen. But to Norm's point, it was a mistake for us to expect politicians to fight the movement for us, especially given the history that we've seen with politicians in this country. They just don't. They just don't. We actually should have been doing it ourselves. And I think that's one of the problems with Justice Democrats. And What's that bill? There were workers fighting for force the vote. There were a lot of sheepdogs that were undermining the attempts of the workers. Yeah, that's a big part of the problem, too. That is a big part of the problem. But I mean, I think when you have these movements that are on the outside, I think the problem is we were still relying on them to lead. We were still relying on Bernie Sanders to lead. Like it was his movement, right? We were relying on the squad to still be involved and still lead and, and lead with Bernie Sanders, right? But the reality is we should have continued fighting and organizing even if we didn't have a leader. This is why I made that bus analogy. I think I posted this. Yeah, I posted this on Twitter this morning. I made the analogy about the bus that we let Bernie Sanders get on our bus and drive our own bus. 
He made us the passengers instead of us being in the driver's seat. We let he get him get into the driver's seat. So when he decided to stop the bus and get off the bus, we felt like we were stranded and abandoned and we didn't know what to do. When in reality, we should have got back in the driver's seat. So all the numbers of people that mobilized around the Bernie Sanders movement after Bernie Sanders uh, suspended his campaign in 2020, we all fell apart. Because to be honest with you, with some of the people in the Bernie movement, the only thing I had in common with them was the fact that we all wanted to support Bernie Sanders, was the fact that we agreed on those policies. So it was Bernie who brought me together with some of those people, people I never would have been in community with, never. So when he walked away, people kind of fell apart. Let's go on. That was the big disappointment of Bernie Sanders because he was repeatedly asked during the campaign, how do you possibly believe, how can you possibly believe you can get your program through Congress? And his reply was always the same. We have to bring masses of people out into the street. And then when the moment came, Bernie disappeared behind closed doors. Yes, he did disappear behind closed doors. And I want to let you guys know, too, there was an article that came out. I think this was this morning. Uh, it was an interview with Bernie Sanders where Bernie Sanders is admitting in the interview, we're never going to get Medicare for all. So Norm's correct when he said that Bernie Sanders told us we're going to have people out in the streets. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to get people out in the streets. The problem is, though, once Bernie Sanders walked away, we didn't get out in the streets. I mean, Norm's right. He walked away. When the time came, he walked away. Let's go on. And everybody else got invested in this thing called, from the old left again, the expression, they became parliamentary cretins. All they talked about was why not this maneuver and why not that maneuver and why not try this and why not try that? Why not try to mobilize why not try to mobilize the millions, the tens of millions, maybe even the hundreds of millions of people who are the 80% and have a vested interest in trying to change this system? And this is the difference between the politicians we have in this country versus some of the politicians in Europe. And this is what Claire Daly, you know, explained this to me so wonderfully is that they actually have politicians that are involved with the outside movement. So when they win their races, they don't forget about the people on the outside. So when people on the outside are organizing the politicians that they elected, the leaders they elected, those people are still also involved in the outside movement. Bernie Sanders and the squad members, that's where they fall short. That's one of the ways they fall short. There's others. But that's where they they don't do that for the most part. Like, yeah, they came out to the Amazon rally, but that was after Chris Smalls and the other organizers won. When AOC was supposed to be there, when they were fighting for it, she didn't show up. And she said she was going to be there. You know? So it was like they show up after the fact. Where are they along the way? So that's a big part of the problem. That's why we struggle to get some of these progressive policies passed. That's why we struggle to get these wins. And I think the reason there's a lot of bickering with people in this space is because we haven't won anything. We haven't received any wins. We don't have Medicare for all. Bernie Sanders just said in an interview recently, we're not going to get it. They haven't increased the minimum wage, not on the national level. They didn't cancel all student loan debt. We haven't won anything. That's why you see people on the left, everyone's so angry at each other, fighting each other. Because there's no wins. Let's go on. They became bystanders again. And in fact, if we're speaking candidly with each other, they became absolutely indifferent, passive bystanders. What percent 
of those people who rallied behind Bernie even followed the force the vote uh, debate? Nobody. But my students were out for those that rally in Washington Square, 25,000, and then next week, just the next borough, Prospect Park, 26,000. That was something spectacular. And 10,000 people here in Boston at Boston Common. I was there, it was over 10,000 people that showed up for Bernie Sanders. And the camaraderie. And then there was a glimpse of it again, a glimpse of it again during the George Floyd demonstrations. So I felt, even though, of course, as you like to say, I take your point about the force to vote, I think from a point of view of a leftist, that's secondary to the bigger issue of, as Rosa would say, our purpose is to organize and educate, not replace, but provide leadership because we do. We had the luxury. We had the luxury of going to good schools to study. Rosa graduated all A's in high school. She won the gold medal, or she would have won it, but they said she was too unruly. She then went on to be one of the first women in the world to get a PhD in economics at the University of Zurich. She took her knowledge. She took her knowledge, her genius, her brilliance, and she gave it to the cause of the working class. And that's what we should be doing. I don't know how I'm, I'll be honest with you, um, uh, Rihanna, you know, I don't know you and most people have a price. I don't know how long you'll stick to it. I hope and pray you do, you know, you do stay the course because the course needs you. No, I'm serious about that. The cause needs you. Just like we were lucky, you know, to have Paul Sweezy in our course, in our cause. Uh, people who got the knowledge, got the privilege, and used it for a for a meaningful cause, something meaningful, the emancipation of humankind. So Norm, I, I just if I could respond to a couple of those things. I think the broader struggle that every movement encounters of what it means to effectively organize, especially in a world where we're living in a labor law context that is very hostile to workplace organizing, where we see that even strong unions like the railroad workers union are subject to poor leadership, where they apparently were not even prepared to go on strike. And of course, the national pressure from the Biden administration who ultimately chose to crush any potential strike using the Railroad Labor Act, where no matter how worker-oriented and worker-led a movement is, the fundamental issue is that organizing is difficult and it's an ongoing project. I don't know that I think it's fair to lay at the feet of one parliamentary objection the failure to organize more broadly across the entire country, a failure that we've been struggling with for 60 years or so. Moreover, the point of force the vote wasn't to subsume all organizing into it, although I should point out that the organizers of force the vote did, in fact, organize. There were phone trees. We mm -hmm. did, in fact, it is not true that they did not, did not reach out to um, professional organizations like the nurses, nurse, National Nurse. Uh, they organized on the ground, too, if I remember correctly, because I think Colin from Indie News Network, I think Colin was also involved with force the vote. When they were in D.C., I thought they organized on the ground as well. Hmm. Just United, who did not respond to me, refused to be back in touch. The, the failure in Force the Vote was that the organizations that do exist were being organized by the squad members who were trying to insulate themselves from accountability. And so we live in a world, my, my view of it is, my view of the fundamental problem with a lot of the left is that it is the elected representatives who are wagging the tail wagging the dog instead of these organizations having them be accountable to them. So that when they made phone calls around and said, we're not going to do force the vote, all of those organizations whose membership, frankly, many of whom were very supportive of force the vote, DSA, for example, did not do a membership poll, but one of the prongs of DSA, the kind of healthcare section, I forget what the, the words are, 
did a vote and the overwhelming majority did support taking action on force the vote. But the leadership of the organization was not responsive. And many people believe it is because the squad members reached out, made it clear that they did not want to follow through with this plan, largely because of their personal frustrations with Jimmy Dore, not because of the, it was a bad plan, but because they just didn't like Jimmy Dore. And so they basically silenced what organizations could potentially have been pressing for this. Um, this goes back to the leadership, guys. What were we just talking about? This is why the leadership is very important. Who you have in those positions actually does matter. And I have not had good experiences with DSA leadership. I mean, like they just seem to be, at least on the national level, I don't know. I can't really speak about all the local chapters, but on the national level, DSA leadership has not been good. Um, by, by having control over their leadership. That all being said, I think the point of Force Vote Again is not to be the organizing in and of itself, but to expose the extent to which people who have, I think, disproportionate faith, a misplaced faith in those elected leftists should not. And by talking about parliament, parliamentary maneuvers, you're exposing the extent to which they are lying about not having power and not being able to do things. When there are clear cases when they do have power and they decline to use it, it's more difficult for them to hide behind the idea that they're just outnumbered. We just need to keep supporting them. We just need to keep voting more members in. And then somehow that's what's going to affect change. And to the extent that you want people to engage more with substantial organizing, part of that project is to convince them not to waste their time on a certain kind of electoral politics. And to that end, I'm glad you brought up these squad members because so much of what you've written about in this book the critique of identity politics, how it's been weaponized and how it's been used to distract was on display this past week. I've tried. I've tried Solidar. Sabi, you should interview someone in DSA leadership about what happened with Force the Vote. Why not? I've reached out to them multiple times, multiple times. They don't, I don't think they want to have that conversation, like to be honest. Sorry, I cut this off. As um, Ilhan Omar uh, was because of accusations of anti-Semitism, was kicked off of uh, the Foreign Services Committee. Uh, and we got a, we were treated to a number of, so I, I'm trying not to use, sermon sounds like I'm being belittling, but um, speeches by squad members about how she's being targeted because she's a Black woman. And many people noted that it was, it seemed really bizarre to focus on her identity as what made her a target. Mm -hmm which she was primary by a black woman, I believe. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the idea that it, she's being targeted because she's black and Muslim, as opposed to having taken some of the positions in a defense of, my, of Palestinian a rights. A friend of mine from the UK, a, a very smart young man, he wrote the same thing to me. Would they have targeted Candy, is her name Candace Jones? Uh, Candace Owens. Kind of, would they have targeted yeah. her because she's a black woman? It's the politics. Right. It was so, I mean, I mean, her politics they were targeting. And she turned it into a person of color issue. Yeah, she did. So they go on there to talk about uh, Ilhan Omar. But then there was another part I wanted to jump to at 1947. Well, how we get back to Sid? How did Sid come back? Okay, there we go. Um, 1947. I want to jump to this part right here. All right, right on the money. If Bernie, as once in a lifetime a candidate he was, got to the end and the point at which so many people felt like he needed to use his organizing influence and power and organization to do a dirty break, to at very least extract more from Joe Biden before endorsing him just days after dropping out of the race, to leverage that organizing prong into a long-term movement strategy, um, to be critical of the Democratic Party rather than talking about his good friend Joe Biden. If even if even Bernie Sanders failed at that, mm -hmm. is that an indictment of the electoral process as a whole in the no, possibility of anyone making it through that gauntlet uh, who's genuinely a leftist? Yes. So I, Norm, I don't know, but Norm looks so frustrated. Like, look at Norm's face. <laughs> he just looks like he's, I don't know what's happening there. But uh, yeah, I, I think the problem is the system that's designed. The system is not designed for 
someone who was running on like these progressive policies to get in, at least not into the White House. Now, the squad, like some of them, like I said, they got lucky, but it's been more difficult for progressives that have run for Congress after them. It has been harder. Right. So the DNC found a way to up their game. Bernie Sanders, two election cycles in a row. And I think the part that's really frustrating for some people who still, you know, very much want to make this happen is that Bernie Sanders, he got so close. Right. Like he was he was almost there. Right. To that, I say. Based on the polls. Based on the numbers, especially numbers I saw at those rallies, Bernie Sanders shouldn't have been almost there. Bernie Sanders should have won. My dad and I had to have this tough conversation a couple years ago. This is when I was kind of sad after Bernie suspended his campaign in 2020. And my dad said that here's a harsh reality you may not want to accept. He said, Bernie Sanders should be president right now. Bernie Sanders should have won based on the numbers, based on the polls. He said, it does not make any sense, but they didn't want Bernie Sanders to win. So they were going to make sure he would not have a chance to win. And there are all different trying to kind of like tricks that they can play. It may not necessarily be, we're going to just smear Bernie Sanders, which mainstream media did, But also look at what happened in 2016. Bernie Sanders won every county in West Virginia and the superdelegates decide to give it to Hillary Clinton. You have the issues with the superdelegates. They can mess with that. They changed the rules for the debates. Look at what they just did in reference to the primary states. They made South Carolina the first state now. So obviously Clyburn supports Joe Biden. So people in South Carolina do actually listen to what Jim Clyburn says. So anybody that's going to primary challenge Joe Biden, they're not going to win South Carolina. And that sets the tone of the race. You see what they're doing? Like they're already changing things because they don't want Joe Biden to not start out strong. And if they were to start with Iowa and New Hampshire again, he would not start out strong again. And people would see that he's weak and he shouldn't even. So the problem is the DNC is not going to allow it to happen. So we saw this happen with Bernie Sanders twice in a row. Instead of pointing fingers, like there's some things that Bernie could have done better. But I think instead of us trying to, I don't know, pick the right pickle out of the jar to see which one is going to be the one that I'm going to bite into. I think instead of us doing that, we need to look at the entire jar and ask ourselves, why are those pickles having a difficult time getting out the jar in the first place? Because of the system, because of the DNC. There's no way you can't tell me with all the numbers that I saw in person, there's no way you can sit up here and tell me That had it not been for the things that happened behind the scenes and some of them in front of our face, there is no way Bernie Sanders does not win on Super Tuesday. There were things done to make other people drop out. Because if they would have stayed in, it would have been worse for Joe Biden. That's not a belief. It's, It's a fact. That's why they dropped out. They were told to. Pete was told to. Pete was offered a position. So they can do all different things. All different things. Look at what they did during the Democratic primary debate 2020. They changed the rules so that Mike Bloomberg could debate. Mike wasn't supposed to be there. How you show up halfway through the debates and here you come and saying, hey, I'm running for president too. And because he's he has the money, he can buy his way in. It's not a fair system. We don't have a true democracy in this country. That's part of the problem. But the money controls everything. And big pharma and all these other corporations, there was no way in hell, looking back on it, there was no way in hell they were going to allow Bernie Sanders walk into the White House. And I think that's something that we have to seriously, you know, stop and and reckon with, I think. I don't want us to... uh, uh get too lost in the Bernie Sanders issue. Um, I do speak about it at some length in the book because that was, as it were, the moment of truth. 
where you saw the old left versus the identity politics left at the moment of truth, you saw where they stood. However, I'm not making excuses for Bernie Sanders. I'm very angry at what happened or what he, but I think there are two points to be made. Point number one, as many people said, Bernie grew the movement, but the movement grew Bernie. He wasn't the same person during the campaign as he was before the campaign. He became much more radical during the campaign, even on issues like Israel-Palestine, where he was forced to move much more to the left than he had been before the campaign began. And when the campaign ended, there was, if you allow me, there was an ambiguity in the campaign. It wasn't clear whether it was a presidential primary or it was building a movement. If it was a presidential primary, then of course Bernie had the prerogative to control everything. But if it was building a movement, the decision making should have been much more democratic than it actually was. Meaning that one person shouldn't have been the one making the decision. So we need to ask ourselves something. Was it just Bernie running a political campaign or was Bernie Sanders actually trying to create an outside movement? See, this is the thing. Like he was trying to create, I guess, a political movement around the country, right? I think we've learned a lesson from this because if that person doesn't win, the movement just disappears. But in reference to the outside movement, I think what Norm is saying is that that should be democratic. It's kind of like socialist alternative, right? Like Shama Sawan has talked about this multiple times before. Socialist alternative, it's a Marxist organization. So that it's not like they have a leader telling people what to do. These groups are made horizontally, not unilaterally. So technically, for those of us who still wanted the movement on the outside, we should have been working together horizontally to make that happen. I think what Norm is trying to tell us is that maybe we shouldn't have been looking for a leader and maybe we still don't necessarily need a leader. Maybe that's what Norm's trying to say, because the moment Bernie Sanders lost, that was the end of the movement. So we can't put movements through political campaigns anymore. Bernie said he was building a movement, but he carried on as if it were a presidential primary where he and a handful of others made all the uh, basic decisions. Once he lost, well, there were two things, and I'll end it there. Number one, Bernie did not want to be blamed for Trump winning. So he wasn't going to do anything which could any way, in any way be construed as having contributed to Trump's victory over Biden. So then you don't go across the country and stand in front of thousands of people and tell them that you're starting a political revolution. You don't go and stand up in front of 10,000 people at Boston Common and tell all of us, we're starting a movement across this country. We're going to have a revolution and we're going to change this country, just like the civil rights movement. I have the whole speech on tape, so I remember everything that was said. He was making comparisons to what his movement was doing and he was comparing it to the civil rights movement. This is what we're going to have sweep across this country. So if Bernie was afraid... And this goes for both times because Trump ran both times. If Bernie was afraid that Donald Trump was going to win, then Bernie Sanders shouldn't have gone across the country telling people he was starting a movement. That's my take on that. So he was not going to play the bargaining game because if Biden lost, of course, the fingers would be pointed at him. And he wasn't willing to accept that burden, that moral burden. Even if it were incorrect, he still didn't want to. And secondly, once the campaign ended, he became the old Bernie. He became a gadfly, not in the House, but in the Senate. And he just resumed his old role. Because as I said, the movement grew Bernie. But once the movement dissipated, it was back to working very conscientiously having the same conviction 
mm. but no longer as part of a mass movement. It was back to Congress. He knew he knew he had to make a choice. The choice was if he was going to influence Biden, he couldn't draw out a mass movement because he knew Biden wouldn't tolerate that. I don't want to be pressured by people. Why are you bringing all these rallies to Washington? You know, Biden but then Bernie shouldn't have told people that even if he lost, he would be still right outside with his people. See, at the end of the day, these people, they're politicians. They're politicians. You can't trust it. You can't. Even someone like Bernie said, this is what I kept trying to tell people about Bernie. Did I ever think that Bernie would do this to us? Absolutely not. One of the worst things that he did was he took money from working class people and then he sold them out. It's one of the worst things. People actually did believe that he was going to fight. They actually did believe in him. Biden would have shut Bernie out. So the price for having Biden's ear was to resume being the old Bernie. Do I think that was a correct decision? No. Totally, completely disagree with it. But that's the issue. If, if Bernie being in some ways the platonic ideal you can imagine of a candidate for the moment, still made that kind of a choice. Is that, are we attributing that to just a mistake on Bernie's part, a, mor a moral failing, a, fail a failure of reasoning on Bernie's fault that the next oh, person sorry. might not succumb to? Or do we think that that's kind of a structural inevitability? It's not a mistake. It's not a moral uh, failing. Bernie Sanders has been a politician for a long time. Bernie Sanders knows exactly how the system works. Bernie Sanders had already said to Jesse Ventura at the beginning of his 2016 campaign that if he lost, he would be supporting Hillary Clinton. He had already decided that and made that decision. And Jesse and Chris Hedges and Shama Sawant were trying to get Bernie Sanders to start some type of third party thing. This was goes all the way back then. And Bernie Sanders didn't want to do it. And that right there tells me that Bernie Sanders, he knew the system. He knows exactly how it works. He never had any intention on actually continuing with that movement outside of those campaigns. That's the thing. That's that's the hurtful part. I think that some people may not want to hear or may not want to accept, but that is the hurtful part. Bernie Sanders already knew, he had already acknowledged it, that he would support Hillary Clinton. How many times did he tell us on the debate stage, 2020 debate stage, how many times did Bernie Sanders tell us, if I lose, I will support the Democrat nominee? And so it was funny to me when people started booing him at the end when he said, we need to vote for Joe Biden. I will be supporting Joe Biden. And people were booing him. I'm like, you guys didn't watch any of these debates? How many times did Bernie Sanders say that he would support the Democratic nominee? That also should have been a news flash to people. That should have been a big red sign because if he was telling you that then, then you should have known that after, after the campaign, if he lost, he wasn't going to be outside with his people and his movement. But somehow this went over people's heads. I, st I still didn't get it till the end of the day. Like after Bernie suspended his campaign, people were like, I'm so mad at Bernie because he said he's supporting uh, Joe Biden. I was like, he told you on stage multiple times that he would support the Democrat nominee. So it was really weird to me that people were surprised by that. It's just like, I don't know, man, maybe I was the only one watching these debates. And I that just... That justifies I, I, not I putting that, that much stake in any... I recognize that Bernie was, at that moment in, t in time, he was irreplaceable. You know, there's this whole debate in Marxism about uh, what's called the, 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 great, uh, the, 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 the great role of a hero in history. Was Napoleon uh, irreplaceable? Was, well, a whole a large number of characters, were they irreplaceable? And the Marxist view is no. The Marxist view has always been, if it weren't him, the place would have been vacant and somebody else would have stepped into his place. So it's a kind of optical illusion. You only think he was absolutely necessary. Do you, because, but do you believe that? Do you believe no, that, Norm, well, as we look I, around? I find it interesting 
that if you read Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, the Russian revolutionist, when you read his history of the Russian revolution, even though Trotsky was a deep, uh, a deeply steeped in Marxism, it was a reflex for him. He said, you know, 1917, Lenin was irreplaceable. Had Lenin not come along, there wouldn't have been a Russian revolution. Uh, he said he was irreplaceable at that moment. And I, trying to avoid the great man theory of history, I still have to say at that particular moment, because I lived it, I experienced it, I watched it, uh, and I participated in it. I don't think any other candidate could have done, could have pulled off what he did, because we live in such cynical times. But what did he do? I mean, I'll give Bernie credit for introducing the conversation. Like, that's one thing I will say. I give him credit for introducing the conversation and waking a lot of people up. You know, I think I guess Norm is trying to say, did we really need Bernie there to do that? Uh, I, I think you you kind of did for some people, because like I said, like he did wake a lot of people up to the things that w we should have or could have in this country that we really weren't trying to fight for. Do I mean, like, I, I'm not trying to I'm really not trying to minimize the way that the campaigns ra radicalize people, they certainly radicalized me. They obviously dramatically changed my life. I'm not trying to minimize what did happen, but some people are very concerned that the idea that we were almost got it, you know, we just, we were so close, we should just keep trying and trying again, is obscuring the extent to which they let us get as far as we're gonna get, and then there's just no possibility and that we're all wasting too much time, too much money, too much energy on these electoral efforts. I mean, people are looking, I, there, there's I, I, ongoing. I, I, yeah, I, I... yeah. And I think, you know, for me, I, I just don't, I don't understand why the focus has to be only on national politics. I think you can get more accomplished locally, electorally, if we want to talk about electoral politics, but it's hard to talk about anyone else running without changing the system and the structural barriers that are in place. It's hard to talk about anybody else going in as a progressive without getting corporate money out of electoral politics, especially on the national level. It's hard to talk about anyone else. This is why when people mention Mary, even Marianne Williamson to me, it's hard to even think about the possibility because I already know that the game is fixed. And I didn't know that at the time when Bernie was running. But now that I know that, it's hard for me to even think about anybody else having that possibility of getting in because the game is fixed. So how are you supposed to win if the game is fixed against you? And so I think that's the thing. And, and then I want to go into... This clip here, I don't spend too much time because I realize I've been talking for too much. Um, I want to go to this clip here where they do talk about the Marianne Williamson part. This is something that Norm mentioned here about what he think Marianne Williamson will be able to do. And again, I, I know there's a lot of focus on the person, the person, the person. But for me, it's not even so much the person. It's the system that's in place that's making it difficult for anyone to run into that lane running onto these progressive policies, especially grassroots campaign. Listen to this. Uh, do I believe a Marianne Williamson would inspire these people who's, who we need? My answer is categorical no. She has no history with working class politics. She, I don't think she has a grasp of them. Uh, and I don't believe as I've said several times today, I don't think you can build a movement on any other solid foundation which will embrace the 80 percent except uh, uh, class uh, uh, politics. This is a big part of the problem here. Um, and this, this is not even just a Marianne thing. It's, you know, a lot of our politicians tend to come from money or if they were lawyers or, you know, they were a judge. Like a lot of them, it just like they it seems like that when you look at the class politics, it's very difficult for someone who's working class to get a political, a political uh, position in DC. Look at all the struggles that Maxwell Frost is going through, even just trying to get an apartment in DC. So uh, the way the system is kind of set up is like, 
it's set up in a way that makes it almost impossible for people who are working class to get those political positions. This is just reality. And I'll tell you one, one reason why. If you want to win, well, you got to quit your job and campaign full time. That requires you having money put aside so that you can do that. A lot of times working class people don't have the money like that. Maxwell Frost talked about this. So I think, again, it's, it's not designed for that. This is why most of the time the people who run are people who are already wealthy. And a lot of times they don't come, they don't understand the working class. They don't come from the struggle. They don't understand. So those are the people who are speaking on behalf of the working class, but they've never been working class. That's another reason why we don't get the things that we should. Uh, so here's the follow-up question. I Richard about it, but that's not... No, 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 that's, that's fine. That's but the follow-up question... William, that's not Marianne Williamson. That's completely fine. The follow-up question, though, is, is there value in her running? Not, is she going to inspire revolution, which is the question you answer, but is there value in her running to have her on the... For, wait a minute. Me, to, to have her... To have her on the debate stage, to have someone who's not, you know, just Joe Biden. This is something we need to talk about. Bree mentioned her on the debate stage. This is another piece where the DNC could change some things or make it more difficult. Because Joe Biden is a sitting president who is a Democrat. And if Marianne Williamson is running through the Democratic Party, primary challenging Joe Biden, the DNC doesn't even have to allow Marianne Williamson to debate Joe Biden. See, you guys see what I'm saying? It's it's the systems that are in place. It goes back to this issue. Like, I just I want people to think about that. How is Marianne going to be able to, to debate Joe Biden Because the DNC, they make the rules. They make the rules. So I told you they changed the rules in 2020 to get Michael Bloomberg on the debate stage. They raised the stakes during the debates to get Tulsi Gabbard off the debate stage. So I don't believe that the DNC is going to allow Marianne Williamson to just access that debate stage. They may not even show the debate. Even if there was, they may not even show it or televise it. Like, this is the thing, you guys. So we have to look at the systems that are in place. I, I think that's important. Like, I get I get what Bree is saying, but again, I think the focus tends to be on Marianne or whoever would like to do this. The focus tends to be on the person instead of the system that is in place that is preventing these things from happening. I'm sorry. I have to go back a little bit. To have her on the, wait a minute, to to have her, to have her on the debate stage, to have someone who's not, you know, just Joe Biden talking about some incremental change to push the upward window to the left and and force there to be some discussion of the issues that became more mainstream in 2016 and 2020. I, I, I don't have problems with anybody running. Actually, I thought one of the most memorable remarks in the debate, maybe the first one, uh, much to my own su- personal surprise, because I thought Marianne Williamson was a flake. You know, originally when it started, I didn't know much about her. I knew she had, you know, written books that are in the self-help section of Barnes & Noble, which is not my cup of tea. What? Um, but she said it was interesting during the debate, uh, during the issue of Medicare for all and where do you stand on that? Uh, she said, well, I, of course, I'm for making health care accessible to everybody. But she said, I think we we do have to ask the question, why is everybody always going to the hospital and why is everybody want all these drugs? What we need to talk about is why so many Americans have unnecessary chronic illnesses, so many more compared to other countries. That's, I thought, that's actually a very important question. Why are people, able-bodied adults, in such desperate need constantly of, continuously of health care or more drugs and more drugs and more drugs and more drugs? I thought to myself, you know, she's the only one that said that because she's out of the box. She's you know, comes from a totally different place than these other candidates. She's self-help. 
in Barnes and Noble? It was a good question, in my opinion, uh, one that I've often uh, pondered and uh, exhorted on. I think the dependency, for example, of your generation of antidepressants is a complete horror, a complete horror. Um, so yes, of course I would support her running. I would support anyone. If you read my chapters in the book on free speech, I'm a pretty close to, I think you could say, a free speech absolutist. Uh, so, and I do think there are benefits to everybody speaking. I have a whole chapter on why I think there's benefits to Holocaust deniers having a platform to speak. Okay, so Norm there, you know, he just basically was like, do I believe Marianne Williamson would inspire these people we need? My answer is categorically, categorical no. She has no history with working class politics. I don't think you can build a movement on any other solo foundation except class politics. I don't know where the the left goes from here. I mean, for me, I, you guys know where my focus is at. I focus more so on local um, and what I can get accomplished on the local level. And we're going to be meeting with, actually, I'm going to be meeting with Senator Eldridge here in Massachusetts. Uh, this is local. Um, Senator Eldridge, uh, we're going to have a meeting with him about two of his bills. Uh, and one of them is a, a public bank, public bank for Massachusetts. So again, I can't, I, I can't meet with people in Congress about that. You see, you see the difference? Like, like I could meet with one of my like state representatives here in the state house about a bill they have, but I can't meet with anyone in Congress. I can't meet with the squad. You guys see the difference? This is why I tell you focus on, try to focus more on local because all politics is local anyway. Just keeping it 